Yeah, so thank you, Chuck, as well. So we may proceed with your part of the lecture. And at 4 p.m. Ukrainian time, we will continue with uh, analyzing of the pitch text. Yeah, so, which basically means I talk for the next four hours. Uh, so uh, I, I apologize for the last hour. My voice will go. Uh, so look, um, I, I'm sure Will covered with you <clears throat> a lot of the same things that I would cover. And I, I certainly can touch on points that I think are important. Actually, the one question from Nastia about, you know, simplicity and complexity and things like this is something that we should talk about. But I'm also happy just to start with questions. So I don't know, Nastia, do folks know my background? Uh, so all of our all of our hackathon participants got information about your background. So yeah, but they, they didn't read. They didn't read. Yeah, so maybe a brief introduction would be perfect. So uh, so I am a, a professor now at, at Cornell University uh, in the United States. Cornell, as you may know, is, uh, among other things, a big startup university. Uh, we have a technology campus in New York City, uh, part of which I created. Um, our technology campus has the relationship to New York City that Stanford has to Silicon Valley. So people think of us as sort of the, the Stanford uh, type university for the East Coast. Um, my uh, background is actually in finance. So I uh, was a lawyer, but also a banker. Uh, I used to go to Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley, uh, when there were very, very early stage startups, uh, before it was as popular, uh, certainly today, um, in terms of people being aware of it. Uh, and so I've done startups in all across the United States, Cleveland, Boston, again, Silicon Valley, Austin, Texas, you, uh, Iowa once, believe it or not, uh, uh, as either a lawyer or a banker. And it's ranged from the early stage investment all the way through the, the public offering, or, or in some cases, even the acquisition. Uh, someone would buy the company. Uh, in Ukraine, I, I'm the co-founder of uh, an incubator, uh, Incubator, uh, called AO Business Incubators. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Um, we are about one year old, uh, and we're pretty good. We're, we're a little tough, Nastya knows this, uh, but we're pretty good. Uh, so in the one year since we've been, uh, since we finished our first group, um, we've raised over $3 million in funding for our companies, uh, either through grants or equity investments or in-kind services. It's actually, I think, about $3.1 million right now. Uh, which within 12 months is pretty good. In America, it would be pretty good. In Ukraine, it's never been done before. Now, I would like to think that part of the reason is because we're so good. But the real reason is this is just the right time to be doing startups in Ukraine. You, you, are, you are literally coming in at just the right time. If you had said to me five years earlier, three years earlier, that this is something you were interested in Ukraine, sure, why not? But you're at a stage now where there's a real interest and a real focus, not just in Ukraine, but outside Ukraine on the new economy, new businesses that are being developed in Ukraine. So congratulations, you are, you are literally doing it at just the right time. Um, among our startups, uh, one of them was the, the winner of the 2020 Dubai Expo competition, uh, 140,000 people from 150 countries attended. We were number one. Uh, there was a, uh, a competition over 300 applicants. I think it was 309. This was an educational technology competition co-sponsored by the European Commission for all Europe. They selected 15 uh, winners. Uh, the only one from Ukraine came out of our incubator. Uh, they received about $100,000 uh, and they've been invited to a special educational technology incubator sponsored by the European Commission. Some of you know the Lviv IT cluster, uh, Lviv IT Arena. Uh, they are an annual meeting for IT startups uh, in Lviv. Big competition from across Ukraine. Four out of the top 10, so they have top 10 finalists, four out of the top 10 come from AO, come from our incubator. 
You might think this is good. I'm actually very angry. It should have been five, but four is okay. Um, so in any event, we've been pretty good at what we're doing. And I, uh, part of it, of course, is we are a very American uh, approach to incubators. Uh, and we're very American in how we train people. Uh, and that's because it's a global world. The economy is a global economy. And so you need to have that viewpoint. But part of it, quite honestly, is because your timing is perfect. This is the time you should be thinking about doing this work. It's a lot of hard work. And I, I know just from you know talking to Will, I'm sure, and, and talking with me, you'll get a sense of this, but the opportunities are there. Um, how many of you are aware of the Ukrainian Startup Fund? Aha, okay. For those of you that are me, so our Tim does, good. So those of you who are doing technology-based startups, uh, and I think that's most of you, um, the uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Finance has put aside $14 million for grants to Ukrainian startups. Um, the grants for early stage companies, and I think most of you are early stage, is $25,000. Later on, if you become a little bigger, you have an MVP, you have a little bit more of an operation, you can get an additional $50,000. So you can get up to $75,000 in total from this fund. Uh, they, they don't take equity. This is not an investment. It's just a grant. You don't have to repay it. Uh, it, is, it is just direct funding. You, you should Google it, a Ukrainian startup fund. Uh, and you will see the process by which you apply. I think Nastia can tell you as well. Uh, there's a written process. Ultimately, you have to pitch. Um, but this is a great opportunity for you to potentially get good funding. I'm, I'm actually the deputy chairman of this fund, but I have no vote. So I am neutral on this. Uh, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a great opportunity for you to really look into uh, early stage funding. Okay, with that, let me just say, I'm happy to talk, but I'm also happy just to take questions and to, to lead by whatever questions or ideas or thoughts you have. And you can even ask me the same questions you asked Will. Uh, we will agree most of the time, but not always. And sometimes we have a different perspective, even if we do agree, or I can just start talking. So are there any questions up front you'd like to ask? I know Nastia's got questions because she smiled. She, she's holding them in. Um, but perhaps there's a, either Nastia or anybody, if you have any questions or things that you'd like me to cover. Lubov, I know Lubov's interested because she's just there by the camera looking at this, no? Anton as well. Okay, let me start talking, but honestly, interrupt me as I am talking if you have questions. Uh, it is perfectly fine. In fact, it's better because then I will know uh, more precisely, more exactly what it is you're interested in. So the first thing I'm going to talk about actually has nothing to do with pitch decks. Um, it has to do with what is behind a pitch deck. And it's something that I noticed in a lot of the decks that those of you submitted probably needs more work on. This is true not just for you, this is true of startups in general. Uh, and so it's something you need to be familiar with. And it's referred to as customer discovery. Is there in fact a market? Are there in fact people with um, a demand, an interest in what it is you're creating? Now, of course you're going to say, well, of course there is, I mean, I, I live here in this country. I walk around. I talk to people. My babushka said that she th thinks this is a great idea, right? My uh, padruga all thought this is a great idea. Uh, of course, you know, you know, this is interesting. When you are looking at customers and demand, it's almost scientific. Think of it as being really almost scientific. What I mean by this is the things that you decide to do need to be driven by fact, not by opinion. The way to think about the hierarchy is there are facts 
And these could be, this could be data that you find on the internet. It could be your own discovery. You talk to 50 people, 100 people. You're getting information from them, right? These are not 50 friends, right? Your friends will always tell you, oh, Lubov, you're doing a great job. Oh, Anna, I love this job. No, you don't want this, right? You want to have a conversation. By the way, you're not asking them, if I do this, will you pay me? Or if I create that, will you buy it? It's one thing to talk about selling. When you talk about selling, it's a different type of conversation than if you're talking more generally. The idea is to talk, it's a general conversation. Tell me about your life. What makes things difficult for you? What is it that would improve your life? What is it about such and such area, clothing, mom for mom, childcare, whatever it is, right? What is it that would make your life easier? Separately, you can think about how to create the solution, but you don't have to be talking to the, the, the 50 people, the 100 people about specifically what your solution is. Again, you're not selling them. You're trying to understand what's inside their head. You're trying to understand what it is that is a problem for them and how you can go ahead and fix it. Okay, so you start with facts. Then there are summaries based on facts. And then very distant third is opinion. The problem is everybody has opinions. If you tell me, I believe, blah, 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 I'll tell you, well, I believe something different. You know, Artem believes something completely different. Yelena thinks something different, right? Opinion is not really the basis for a business. The business is going to be tied into fact. It could be information generally that you're getting on the internet, scientific data. It could be information, again, you have gathered yourself, not by selling, but by through general conversation. I talked to 53 people and here's what they told me their concerns were, right? Or it could be summaries based on those facts, but it's very much the basis upon which your business grows. Most businesses do not fail because they don't get investments. Most businesses don't fail because the technology is bad. Most businesses don't fail because the teams are not very excited and working hard. They fail because no one will buy their product, because there is no market for what they're doing, because there is no demand for whatever service or platform they're, create, they're creating. So you have to spend a lot of time on this. It's really the critical part. Now back to our pitch deck. It's really the critical part of the pitch. I want to know why it is you're spending all your time in telling me about this business. What, what exactly is the problem? If you can't explain this to me in a way that is scientific and factual, we're done. I don't care that your technology is great. I don't care that you have a great team. If you can't explain to me that there's a market and a demand and an interest, factually, scientifically, everything else becomes kind of secondary, not so interesting. Clear so far? Nastya wants to ask a question. I can tell. She's down. All right, yeah, you said that it's, it doesn't matter. Our team, it doesn't matter. Our solution doesn't matter. All we have to do is to, to show you our market and, and- No, 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 no. What I'm saying is if you can't show me the market, mm -hmm. nothing else matters. Now, if you can show me the market, well, then we'll talk about the solution. Then we'll talk about the team. But in the very beginning, if you can't explain to me why it is factually, there is a demand for what you're doing, factually, that there are people who are, you know, interested, they will be caught up and interested in buying your product, then the technology, the team, I don't care about it. I just don't care. Uh, another, I'll give you an example. Um, you have created the best pen ever. This pen turns into all sorts of colors. Okay, it will turn green and blue and purple. Uh, you know, it just writes. And oh, by the way, if you blow on it, it will sing a song. Okay, and the technology for this pen is amazing. Right, your team gave up 
all of your work, gave up all of your life to just work on this pen and develop this really awesome technology. Is there a business? No, no one wants a multicolored singing pen, right? So unless you can demonstrate to me that there factually is a real demand, a real interest in what you're creating, everything else becomes not interesting. Make sense now? Yeah, I get it, thank you. Don't create a colorful, a color, a bright color singing pen, right? So technology, don't get me wrong, technology is important. Team is important, but they are after you can demonstrate that there's a real interest in what you're doing. Um, now, a number of you in your decks, and this is not uncommon in Ukraine, uh, focus on just the Ukrainian markets. Um, and that's because that's your experience, right? You know, you know people in Ukraine and you know the markets in Ukraine. The question you have to ask yourself is, is that in fact your market? Is it just Ukraine? Uh, or is your market outside Ukraine as well? Um, so for example, one of you has a, uh, I forget the name of it. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the pet food, the monthly pet food box or the weekly pet food box. Um, okay, now that's interesting. But you have to ask yourself, is this the kind of thing that would be interesting in the United States if that's part of your market? If it's just Ukraine, that's fine. How big is that market? I don't know. Have you done your customer discovery? Have you seen if there's a demand? Maybe. It appeals to me, but I don't know whether or not it will appeal to uh, Roxolana uh, or uh, Emily. I just don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and even if it does appeal to the Ukrainian audience, um, to what extent does it appeal to uh, audiences outside? So Marianne has asked, I, I see there's some chat questions, I guess. Is that, uh, okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, how can we count the size of the market? This is uh, Childify. Well, again, you've got to think about, this is a factual question. Uh, you've got to think about what it is, your product, what pain, what, what concern is your product getting at? Uh, and is that concern the same in Ukraine, if that's your focus, as opposed to Germany or France or the United States? Um, that will drive the size of your market. I don't know exactly the size of the market. Rarely do I see a startup at your early stage where I know exactly the size of the market. I don't need to know exactly the size of the market. What I need to know is, is that there is a strong likelihood of a demand for what you're doing. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about, uh, Marianne. So one of the startups that graduated from us is, is creating a music trading platform. Uh, if you're an investor, you can buy an interest in music. Uh, and the artists that provide this music are original artists from around the world. We have no idea what the size of this market is, right? You're talking artists from Nigeria, Brazil, America, Ukraine, you know, Japan, Singapore, Australia. And we're talking about all different types of music, hip hop, rock, country, Western, classical, jazz. And we have users who are interested in investing from all, everywhere as well. Is the market the world? I'm sure it's not. Can we figure out the size of the market? No. However, prior to launching this startup, there was a lot of discovery about whether or not artists needed to raise money, whether or not this was a way, a direct way of, 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 of selling interest in music was something that artists would be interested in, and whether people who like music would be interested in investing. And they were able to check this in Ukraine, in Europe, a little bit in the United States, and there was a consistent response. Yes, there's a demand. So the size of the market, the exact size, still not clear. But we know that there is this, across the various places that we checked, a consistent interest by both artists and by music lovers, they call them, potential investors, 
to get involved in this. This team just got a $2 million investment from a Canadian venture capital fund. We don't know the size of the market. We just don't know. Uh, honestly, whenever the startup tells me the size, I tell them it's too big. Uh, they claim that they can get a million people in the next year. I said, no way. They go, yeah, 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 you're wrong, Chuck. Okay, whatever. Uh, so size is important and you can figure out size to some degree, you can approximate it, get a general sense of size. Once you've got, done your discovery, once you have a sense of what the demand is, uh, but it's really an estimate. And it's also secondary to the more basic question, have you done your homework? Have you checked? Is there enough data to say that what you're doing has an appeal, a broad appeal to a group of people, not just in Ukraine, perhaps in this case, uh, but in countries and markets outside Ukraine? Good, Marianne? Where is Marianne? She's hidden from me. Oh, there she is. Okay. Um, so you might ask yourself, how do we figure out, um, you know, market interest outside Ukraine? How? Just going to do market research. Though. <laughs> how? How? If your market is Chicago, have you been to Chicago? How do you do this? You talk to people, basically. Try to connect with uh, potential customers, uh, stakeholders out there. So, okay. for instance, yeah. No, well, keep on going. You're good answer. Uh, keep on. Yep. Yeah. So, just to give you a case. Uh, in our product, we try to cover mostly uh, Benelux countries like Netherlands, Be Belgium, uh, Germany, Austria. So, we just go and talk to potential customers if they would like to listen to us. How to reach potential customers? By reaching people who know our potential customers. So, we try to pitch our idea in one hour meeting understand whether they're interested or what, where our need or our product appealing to their need. And basically that's how we potentially can estimate the market. Uh, and, and you, and you yeah. this was sort of friends and friends of friends. This was Facebook and Instagram and whatever. Is that how you did this? So, uh, yeah, we have been doing uh, research for the past few months within different research centers. So if we have split our channels of research, right, we do have uh, channels of friends, social medias, also the kind of independent research by doing a kind of uh, Google research, just sending people Google form where people can sure. fill that specific problem. Also talking directly to the people who will be using our product and who also would be buying our product because usually users and customers are kind of different thing. So, yeah. It, it depends on the product, but yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So, so yeah, the, 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 so what uh, uh, Bogdan is saying is, uh, you know, there are ways to reach out and talk to folks. Um, it doesn't have to be as specific as what he's describing. I mean, if you have the ability to contact people, that's great. But sometimes it's not easy to do this. It could simply be creating a Facebook page or an Instagram page and seeing how many followers you, followers you get and then contacting them. How many of you guys know Nuka? The Ukrainian startup. Okay, Nastya knows Nuka. Okay. So, so Lida, you know Nuka? I saw a smile there, I don't know. Um, maybe. So Nuka is a startup that was created by a bunch of 16 year olds in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the lead, uh, there, were not, there are three founders. The lead founder, Katya, uh, basically, as a group, they designed a pen that was really a metal, it was just a metal, a metal stylus. Um, and they treated, they chemically treated paper, and you could write on this paper with this pen, and they called it the eternal pen. Uh, you could write underwater, you could write in space, you could write upside down, it never went, it never, it never ran out. And they developed this uh, in uh, Kiev. Uh, when they were in high school. And they were trying to figure out what the demand was. So they did it on Facebook. They just went onto Facebook. They created a Nuka page. And they began to get followers. And they began, just like Bogdan was describing, they began to communicate with the followers. What do you like about this? What could be improved? What do you think? Right? Tell your friends. Um, and this was obviously very inexpensive. They ended up with a fairly large following, 30 or 40,000 people, as I recall. Uh, it was a fairly large following. This was over, but because you know, it was kind of cool. 
right? This idea of a bunch of 16 year olds that were doing this, it was just kind of cool. And they ended up more and more people following this page. That was their customer discovery. They didn't have the money to do anything else, but they had a pretty good sense that there would be interest in this. And ultimately they did a Kickstarter campaign and raised something like three, $400,000. Uh, they also ended up getting uh, um, a fair amount of uh, foreign investment, investment from outside Ukraine uh, to continue to grow the business. Um, so the point here is you wanna be thinking the way Bogdan's thinking, you wanna be thinking the way Nuka was thinking. You know, if my market is more than Ukraine, how do I access the market? It may be the case also that you're talking to a smaller group of businesses. Maybe they're distributors. Maybe they are, they are companies that could be partners of yours. You'll find them on the internet. When you Google, don't use Ukrainian Google. Use US or UK Google. I don't know why, but the search algorithms are different and you don't catch as much. I just don't know why. Uh, so use, you know, use the US Google or the U uh, UK Google and, and you'll pick up um, a broader selection, I think. At least that's been our experience. Um, and contact them. What you don't want to do is contact, look, some of you are quite young. I got to tell you, use this to your advantage. Nuka used their youth to their advantage. Uh, what do I mean? It was not, hi, I'm Katya, I am the CEO of Nuka. It is a great honor and pleasure to contact and work and associate, no. It was, hi, I'm Katya, I'm 16, I'm doing a startup in Ukraine. Here's what we're doing, can you help me? Very short, very direct, boom. You'd be amazed how many people will come back and wanna to talk to you. They'll just think it's cool that what you're doing is this kind of cool thing. And at least in the United States, if it doesn't cost people a lot, effort, time, money, if you ask for help, they'll be, they'll be happy to help you. You're not going to get 100%. Maybe it's 30, 40, 50%, but you will start to get feedback, right? You can follow up with uh, calls on uh, WhatsApp or, or whatever uh, and talk to people, Skype, uh, and get additional information uh, as you're working with them. Now, Again, why am I talking about customer discovery? It becomes very, very clear. What do we do if we're not a 15-year-old girl, says Svetlana? Well, you don't have to be a 15-year-old girl. I just happen to be giving you that particular example. Uh, clearly, I am not a 15-year-old girl. Um, so it doesn't have to be tied to necessarily age or gender. Uh, the point is simply, I'm doing a startup. I need your help. Uh, if you happen to also be younger, I'm saying that's actually an advantage. Younger people very often think, oh, no one will take me seriously. I'm only 15. No, actually, certainly in the United States, people think it's actually kind of cool. Um, I, actually, I'll give you another, another good example. I had a student here at Cornell, and uh, he had developed carbon-based uh, plastic. Right, so it's plastic that is made from potatoes. And um, it, in terms of heat, it has all of the characteristics of normal plastic and it even outperforms normal plastic. The difference is if you put water on it, it will dissolve in two weeks, right? Um, so it has certain uses, insulation, right? You're not going to want to use this plastic in a submarine, that would be bad. But insulation, it's, you know, it, it, it's something that's valuable. Smart kid, hardworking, cool technology. We patented it. We got patent protection for this technology, but no production experience. He was, he was 17 when he came into my office. And so I said to him, look, you have to go out and find a partner to get production experience, to understand more about large production of this. And I thought he was going to have 20 people that wanted to work with him. And six months later, I called him and said, what's going on? I've heard nothing. He said, I have, no one's interested. Really? Nobody. I said, okay, we're going to practice. We're going to do a telephone call practice. Call me up like you want to work with me. His name's Evan. So he's, hello, my name is Evan. 
I am the CEO and blah, 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 blah. And like, no, no one's going to want to talk to you, Evan. It says it, look, I'm Evan. I'm 18. I've got this really cool plastic. I'm a startup. I could use your help. Uh, within three weeks, he had three companies working with him. And so it's a, it's a question of pitch and presentation. Doesn't have to be age, doesn't have to be gender. It's more the fact that you're a startup and you're looking for, I need your help. You have something that I, you have knowledge that I don't have. Can we talk about this? Okay. Or you, or you can hire a 15 year old girl. I'm kidding. Don't do that. Um, anyway, so why am I talking about customer discovery? It's because it becomes very clear in the deck very early on if you haven't done this homework. You can just tell by the way the deck is presented. It's my opinion. It's what I think is happening. Another way of saying it is your pitch is like the top of an iceberg, right? You see that 10%, but there's 90% below the water. If that 90% isn't there, the iceberg goes away. And people that are familiar with decks and people who are familiar with startups very quickly can see has there been discovery or not, right? Has there been enough diligence, enough work done to support the value of what you're doing? Good. Ultimately, what am I looking for here? Am I looking for good tech? No, well, yeah, sure, why not? But honestly, I'm not a tech expert. And when, we're, when you're showing me your deck, yeah, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. I don't know. Right? Am I looking for, yeah, you know, so at some point, someone will look at the tech, not me, right? It'll be an IT guy or maybe a, you know, medical, a medical guy. My brother is a medical professor. We have a very strange family. Uh, and so, you know, if it's a law thing, I look at it. If it's a medical thing, my brother looks at it. You know, you know, eventually that will happen. But as far as the pitch goes, I don't know. You could be lying to me. So the tech, sure, it's interesting, but that's not what's happening during the pitch. Um, customer discovery, important, right? If you can't tell me that you've done the homework, uh, you know, I'm not sure if there's really a market for what you're doing. But ultimately, what am I getting at? When I'm, when I'm looking at even things like customer discovery, you know, putting aside the technology, what am I really trying to understand? At the end of the day, what you're really selling is the team. This is why Nastia was so unhappy when I said, I don't care about the team. What I'm really selling at the end of the day is the team. The point is though, if you haven't done your homework, then you're not the right team, right? In other words, if you haven't gone out and done the discovery, if you haven't done all this work that's necessary for me to understand that there's a demand for your product, it means you're probably not the guys I want to work with. The tech I'm less worried about. At an early stage, I'm much more focused on, is this the team that can get the, 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 the deal done? You know, back to my music investment platform. This is not the first music investment platform in the world. This is the fourth or fifth one. There are others that are actually doing this sort of thing right now. One is in Spain. So why is it that these guys out of Ukraine are getting such attention, getting such you know, large investments, $2 million? Why? It turns out they come out of the music industry. The guy who founded this business in Ukraine was the founder of the main Ukrainian record label. His partner is actually in America. His partner was the producer for Madonna. Won't you invest in the Nastia, head of the Ukrainian record industry and the producer for Madonna? Sounds like a pretty good team. Do you care about the technology? Nah, we'll figure this one out, right? Have they done the homework? Yes, they did the homework. Clearly they did. They went out and checked to see if there was a demand. And this is a pretty damn good team right? They have real industry expertise. That's the driver. They don't even have a trading platform at this stage. In fact, to create this trading platform requires lots of legal analysis because you're trading things. They don't even have the legal analysis done. 
And already they've gotten over $2 million in investments. Okay, the team is critical, but I need to understand that you are really the right team. It's not just that you are the Madonna producer. I want to know that after I give you my money, you're going to work really hard to create a, a good business for me. And so when I'm looking at the deck, I'm not necessarily looking at it for, gee, do I agree with all of her data? If I don't agree, I'm going to push. But at the end of the day, I'm more interested not in whether or not the size of the market is 3 million or 3.2 million or 2.5 million. I'm much more interested in did you do the homework? And does this show me that you're a team that I can give money to that will actually do the business? And so a large part of the pitch is really an extension of is this a good team? Make sense? Um, let's see, Daria has a question here. Um, Yeah, um, I actually, uh, so to do, so where is Daria? There she is, Daria. So I actually like, I like your deck, um, but, but, I, but, I, uh, but you have a customer discovery issue. <laughs> I remember this deck. Um, uh, so, so Daria's question is, um, to what extent should we take into account COVID? Um, in other words, do you count COVID risks and how do you consider them? Well, this is part of this is part of your story. This is part of your customer discovery, Daria. So the question to ask is: Has COVID changed the way in which cafe owners think about their business, and has it changed the way in which people are likely to interact with cafes, and has it changed the way in which people um, are likely to work in the freelance area that you're interested in? Um, so, to, so, so. Today, for example, in a post-COVID world, um, let's assume there is no more COVID, right? Are you more likely to stay at home or are you more likely to go out and sit next to a lot of coughing people at a cafe? Maybe you don't care. Before COVID, I think most people would have said, I'm gonna go to the cafe, why not? And if there's a vacancy, I should go there. Post-COVID, I don't know if that's true anymore. I just don't know. The answer may be, yeah, people want to go. The answer may be that there are fewer people going to cafes and so there's more space. Uh, and so there's an interest, but again, the reason there are fewer people at the cafes, even post COVID, maybe because no one wants to go to cafes <laughs> post COVID, including freelancers. So I don't know the answer, right? That's why to me, that is a customer discovery question. The basic concept, Dari, just so you know, I like it. Right, this type of um, using, uh, so, so just, you know, Daria's startup is a way to match vacant space in cafes to freelancers who are looking for vacant space to work in. And so there's gonna be, uh, you know, and, and, and so her, her site will identify these locations. What openings are free? Is it good Wi-Fi? Is the coffee tasty? I don't know, whatever, okay? And the question is, you know, this is more likely in a COVID world what about in a post-COVID world? But but the answer really is the answer really is not a question for me. It's a question for your market. Again, I think that there will be a demand for this in a post-COVID world. But I also know that there are a lot of people that are very nervous about going to public spaces now, even after COVID. And so maybe the demand is less. I just don't know. Or maybe one of the things you have to think about, Daria is cleanliness as a factor in your cafes. So in other words, one of the factors that you would, would be on your thing is not just simply Wi-Fi and coffee, but does the cafe regularly do deep cleaning, right? Are they careful about this? I don't recall that being one of your criteria, maybe it is, but, but the point is you, you wanna be thinking about how would you address this concern? So if you were to talk to cafe uh, freelancers and the freelancers were to say, hey, I would go to cafes, except, you know, I'm really worried about cleanliness. Ah, well then now you know what your, your customer base is concerned about, or, or maybe it's your user base. I don't know, who, I can't recall who you're charging. Uh, but the point is you would have a better sense of what their concerns are and that would be reflected in your platform. Make sense? No, uh, thank you for the answer. Good. Thank you. Um, so competition, by the way, is also part of this. 
it's competition is not a bad thing. But in order to understand, again, customer discovery, local demand, you also want to understand what else is already out there. Again, just the fact that there is competition doesn't mean you're dead. Another way of saying it is, if you tell me that what you're doing is not being done by anybody, that there is no competition at all in the market, that you're the first guys, I'm going to ask you, why is it that you're so damn smart and everyone else is so stupid? How is it that you have discovered this and the rest of the world hasn't, right? So discovery, uh, as part of the discovery process, you should be also looking for competition. If you don't find competition, you really should ask yourself, why is there no competition? Why is it nobody else is in this space? What is this telling me? Um, I mentioned this, for example, in the, in the case of the, 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 the dog food. Who, who, who are the pet people? Um, the pet people, you have direct competition in the United States. Um, I forget what they're called. It's the, it, but it's, it's, it's the same idea. It's, it's, a, it's you can order uh, dog food or pet food online and it's automatic. Every week or every two weeks, they send it to you. Uh, again, doesn't mean that what you're doing is bad, uh, but you do want to use that information to think about what makes you unique. Is there something that we can do beyond what this competition is doing that would address a concern that even with this competition is not being addressed? So it's a competition focus, but really it's part of customer discovery because you want to understand first that there is a market and secondly, what's going to make you more attractive compared to you know, other competitors uh, in this market. And all of these things, now, for those of you who have done decks and seen decks, this should all resonate, right? There are pages in the decks that all talk about this. But again, you have to understand the paper is last. It's the 10%. When I'm looking at decks, I'm really looking at that 90%. And if you've seen enough decks, and unfortunately I've seen too many, very quickly you figure out, is the homework done? And that then tells me, is this a team I want to invest in? Back to why Nastia was so excited. Is this a team that I think is a really good team that I can invest in because they know what needs to be done, they're going to work hard, and they're going to you know, do whatever is necessary for the business to be, to be valuable. Good so far? Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the pitch. So um, Will touched on this. Uh, that, this was the question, I think, where I joined. Um, so as most of you know, right, there are three types of pitches. These are in competitions, right? There's the 30-second pitch. It's called an elevator pitch. Uh, I've been on many Ukrainian elevators, okay? That's more like 90 seconds, but you should do a 30-second pitch. Uh, they're very slow. Um, there's the three-minute pitch. And there's the five minute pitch. Okay, I'm going to tell you something that Nastia is not going to like to hear, or Olga, the sponsors of this. Pitch contests are stupid. These types of competitions are ridiculous, but not really. What do I mean? They're very artificial, right? It is true that you have a limited amount of time to talk to investors. It is true that you will meet people where you have to be able to explain what you're doing in three minutes or 30 seconds. But the competition itself is kind of stupid. It's very, very artificial. You know, nice slide, it's more like entertainment. Nice slides and I'm dancing around and people are, you know, it feels more like entertainment. So what is the value? Why do we do these competitions other than to make startup entrepreneurs sweat? The reason is really what Will was talking about when I joined, which is we want to know that you know the key points of your business and can explain them in a very simple way, right? That you can, in 30 seconds or three minutes or five minutes, engage me by touching on the high points in a very simple, direct way 
that will that will get my attention. It doesn't mean that you talk fast in five minutes. That's not the purpose. Well, I'm going to be able to speak really, really fast in five minutes and get it in. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to be able to highlight the two or three or five or 10 points and be able to explain them quite clearly. When I was a young professor, so I practiced you know, as a banker for about 20 years, but when I started as a professor, uh, I was having lunch with a very senior professor. Uh, and he asked me, he said, Chuck, what are you covering in your lecture today? I said, well, I'm covering the following 43 things. And I went through and described all 43. You know, oh, very interesting, Chuck. I said, I said, well, what are you covering, Harvey? Well, three things. <laughs> and the point was, you are going to be a lot more effective in conveying information if you can take all these different complicated ideas and boil them down into three or four key points. If you think of it this way, three minutes, 30 seconds, five minutes becomes very easy. All of the stuff we've been talking about in terms of discovery, understanding the background, the basis for the market, the demand for your product, all of that will come out in that very short discussion that you have. Again, people that have done a lot of this investment work will very quickly pick this up. Or they'll even ask you a question. Hey, Svetlana, you say that moms are interested in this, or you say that you know, customers are interested in that. What's, your, what's the basis for this? And if Svetlana says, well, Babushka told me this, okay, we're done, right? If she says, well, I talked to 70 people, you know, in Kiev, in Frankfurt, in Chicago, or I put up a Facebook page, or I did the following additional research, and here's what I learned. Ah, okay. Whether or not I believe the research is secondary, I know Svetlana did the work. And that at this early stage, when we're talking about this initial discussion, that's the uh, most critical point, right? In other words, the goal of your pitch is to get another pitch. The goal of this meeting is to get a second meeting. The goal is to get questions and engagement with what you're doing. No one after five minutes is going to say, Anton, here's $100,000. It doesn't happen. Maybe in, in serials it happens. It doesn't happen in the real world. If it does happen, something's wrong. Uh, instead, what happens is Anton pitches me and I go, cool, I like that idea. Let's talk a little bit more, Anton. Can you meet uh, next week? Anton goes, yes. He comes, he talks for 30 minutes. I go, well, this is really interesting. I'm going to bring in my tech guy. Can you meet with your tech guy maybe in the next week? Yes. That meeting, I'll go, Anton, this sounds really neat. Uh, let's talk about economics now. Let's talk about you know, price and, and, and uh, evaluation and investment. So it's pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch. Your goal in this first pitch is to get them hooked, get them excited, get them interested so that you can have that second, that third, that fourth meeting, right? And so the, to, to do this, if you go ahead and throw you know, 50 things at me, maybe I'll remember one of them. If you throw very clearly three or four or five things to me, ah, I'll get it. And then if you're ready to answer these very basic questions, how did you assess demand? Who are your competitors? What makes you unique, right? How are you going to build this product, right? All that homework, the 90% that's hidden. Then I'll know this is a good team. Anton, let's meet next week. If you can't answer it, that's fine. As a venture capital investor, you have to realize so I'm, I'm a professor now, but my, I have a lot of friends who do this work. They get 100, 200 emails a day with proposals. Their game is not whether or not you are the best. Their game is a numbers game. In other words, Anna, whatever startup you're working on, I know you think is your baby. You're saying to yourself, this is the best thing in the world. I'm devoting my life to it. This is, the, this, is, this is fantastic. As an investor, unfortunately, I'm seeing 200 Annas a day. I just want to make sure 
that I'm statistically on probability picking the best Annas to work with. And if it turns out that you don't give me a good answer or Anton, you don't convince me you're the right team, I move on. Maybe I made a mistake. It's okay, I have 199 people to talk to today, right? Tomorrow I'll have a new 200. And that's why the goal is to demonstrate quickly, right, short period of time that you've done your homework and that you're able to convey these three or four things that make what you're doing very exciting. Make sense? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, so you don't regret uh, that you put one Anna above another Anna? So if they didn't interest, get interested oh, you? Oh, do, so. do I? Sure, mm. sure. Uh, so it may be that I go ahead and I've picked the wrong Anna. And the Anna that uh, I didn't support goes on and creates Facebook, right? It happens, it happens. Uh, and you will hear investors say, damn, I could have put money into Facebook. But it's part, of the, it's part of the process. I mean, if I was able to pick every good Anna every day, I would be a billionaire and I would retire tomorrow. We know I can't. As, an, as, as, you know, as a venture capital fund, I have my own investors. My investors know I can't. What they trust is that I'll be able to pick good Annas. I won't necessarily pick every right Anna, but they know that the Annas I pick will be good enough. Make sense? Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, may I continue to talk, Nasty, or do you want me to stop? Uh, yes, so now it's exactly 4 p.m. on Ukrainian time, so we can proceed with the talk. I can wait continue to we'll... talk. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah, because we are, we are waiting for Will to... Will's just joined us, you see. But I'm, ah, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, I can see Will as well. Uh, so we can have like five to ten minutes, and then we will uh, continue with uh, with analysis okay. of the text. Well, well, you know, while we're wait, are there any other questions at all? Great questions that you asked. Okay. Well, uh, Will and I, I'm sure, as we're going through the decks, you'll have additional questions. But uh, I, I think. Uh, I suspect some of what Will was discussing with you, some of what I've been discussing with you will come up as we're re re reviewing the decks as well. Uh, okay, so uh, Nastia, 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Spasibavam. Okay.